Good morning. I hate to break up good conversation, but we, we do have to get going this morning. It is um, wonderful to, to see everybody. I've um, got a lot of guests here, so welcome. Glad to, glad to have you. Um, welcome everybody as well who is tuning in online wherever you are out there. It's such a, such a good, good, good day to worship the Lord. And so um, good, good, good Sunday in store for us. A couple of announcements. As we get going, first, um, I just want to say a big thank you. Um, I was, as I was gone last Sunday um, on vacation, we went and saw the, the solar eclipse in totality, something my daughter was just so thrilled to be able to do. And so I am just so thankful, i said this before, but to be a part of a congregation with such amazing leaders, uh, Greg, Beverly, Rick, the whole choir, just everybody that made it possible for us to, to go and be away um, as a family for a week. Um, and then also, just a quick reminder or a, a quick announcement uh, to save the date for our Vacation Bible School this summer. We're going to be doing it July 8th through 10th. Um, that's a Monday through a Wednesday in the evening. And so um, we'll, we'll get some more formal announcements out about that. But save the date. Start inviting kids, grandkids. We want this to be a big, fun celebration um, with, with all of our community children. Um, so with that, let's go to God in prayer. Miraculous God. Come to us now and, and speak your peace to our hearts. Touch us with your Holy Spirit. Reveal your word that we may hear your message this day and live as your disciples in the days to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. 
Please stand for our call of worship. We come with joy to celebrate God's love. We come with hope to witness God's power. We come ready to proclaim God's presence to all. Amen. If you'll remain standing for our opening hymn, His Name is Wonderful. We're going to sing that through twice. That's number 174. Let's all sing together. Will you join me in affirming our faith with the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite our children to come on up. doing okay good good morning so good to see y'all as always um you know we're starting a brand new sermon series on some of the kind of shorter books in the bible but today we're studying a a prophet do y'all know which prophet it is not not john it's old testament john we're going to talk a lot about john in this sermon series but not not today it's a prophet in the old testament i heard y'all talking about it when i walked by y'all's room earlier starts with an o oba Obadiah? 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 Did y'all learn anything about Obadiah? Um, that he was a guy that told those, there's like three guys that speak, those guys that telepathy, and Israelites Yeah, yeah, exactly. He was a prophet to the Edomites, and he was, he was, the Edomites were in trouble because they weren't letting the people of Israel um, into their country when they were facing some, some persecution by the Babylonians. That's right. Um, and so Obadiah's like, hey, Y'all should not have done that. And, and why is that? Because God's got a lesson to us that he, he talks about a lot throughout the Bible. We're supposed to welcome who? Our welcome our neighbors. Welcome the strangers. We're supposed to take care of them and be nice to, be them. Nice to them and love them. Exactly. And, and the people of Edom were not doing that. So they were in trouble. Um, but, you know, it made me think that that's still a good lesson for us today, right? It's a good lesson to say, hey, we should, we should love our neighbors we should take care of them. You don't think so? You think so. You totally think so. Yeah, we should love our neighbors and our friends and even the, the people we don't know so well because um, God says if we want to really follow him and, and be, be Christians like he's asked us to be, like Jesus has asked us to be, um, then we should, we should love all those around them and welcome them. So let's pray. God, we are so, so thankful for, for Jesus and all the ways that he has taught us, um, especially how he has loved us so much. Um, And in that love, he's asked us to love others. So help us to do that each and every single day. Amen. All right, thank y'all.
Our epistle lesson this morning is from Philippians, second chapter, verses one through eight. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. The word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Jody. As we get now, uh, as we get ready to move into a, a time of prayer together, um, just want to remind you, you can find our prayer list on our um, newsletter that we email out every week. I um, encourage you to subscribe for that. Um, one thing I will mention is uh, Lita, our office administrator. Her, her father passed away um, uh, about a week ago, and she's been up in New York kind of handling all of his affairs. Um, so just prayers for her. I think she's planning to fly back today and be in the office this week. Um, but just continued prayers for, for Lita as, they, as her family grieves the loss of her, of her father. Um, and we've also got several other church members who are traveling right now. So just prayers for everybody on the road. Um, friends, let's go to God in prayer. Lord of dawn and darkness, how grateful we are for your loving mercies. You saw our fear and our doubt, our suspicion, our mistrust, and you banished them from our lives, replacing them with hope with peace, with love and joy. Lord, you have called us to be your witnesses to all the world, unafraid of what others might think or say about us. We have been invited out of our darkened hideaways into the light of your world as ambassadors of hope and justice, peace and compassion. So Lord, be with us as we participate in ministries of healing and hope through our church and our community, um, our region, our nation, our world. Give us courage and strength to be your disciples in all the circumstances of our lives. All of this we ask in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord, and the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue our worship this morning with the giving of our tithes and our offerings, by our ushers to make their way forward at this time. Let's go to God once more in a prayer of thanksgiving. God, we are thankful for all the blessings you have poured out on our lives, um, for all the gifts that we have from you. So we pray your blessings on these tithes, these gifts we are about to return. Um, grow them, uh, make them flourish for your ministries here and all over the world. Amen.
Amen. I will invite you to remain standing for our hymn of preparation this morning. We're going to be singing Living for Jesus. That's in our supplemental hymnal, The Faith We Sing. Let's all, uh, it's number uh, 2149. So let's all sing together. <laughs>
Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Obadiah, um, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Hear now the word of God, friends. The vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up. Let us rise against it for battle. I will surely make you least among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. Your proud heart has deceived you. You that live in the clefts of the rock, whose dwelling is in the heights, you say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. Friends, the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we are ever thankful for your word and the the lessons it speaks to us, even from long ago. We pray you would open our hearts and our minds to receive them today. Amen. Um, So like I mentioned with the children um, earlier, we are starting a brand new sermon series this morning. And and I'll tell you what, I I feel like it might be one of those where you're going to be tempted to go run and maybe brag about it a little bit to some of your friends from other Christian denominations. Um, And that's that's because over the next five weeks, we are going to study in in pretty reasonable depth, five different books of the Bible. So that's one book per week for the next five weeks. Sounds pretty impressive, right? Especially especially for a bunch of Methodists. Now, the part you might want to leave out as you're, you know, telling everybody about how smart we're getting over here at the Methodist Church is that all five of these books, well, they only have one chapter in them. In fact, out of the 66 books that make up our Bible, um, these are the only five books that have just the one chapter in them. They are Obadiah, Philemon, 2 John, 3 John, and Jude. It's a series that um, I'm calling One Hit Wonders, and that's because these books, I mean, they're so short, they really only have time to make one point in them. Um, And so basically from now until Pentecost, We're going to work our way through these five books, um, kind of in the order that they appear in the table contents of our Bibles, Um, and we're going to see what these short, sweet, but mighty pieces of Scripture um, have to teach us still today. Um, And and so first up is Obadiah. Um, Now, if you don't know anything about Obadiah, you are probably not alone. Um, The whole thing is just just 21 verses long. Um, And it's sandwiched in between the book of Amos and the book of Jonah, which are much more more popular Old Testament books. Um, Now, like Amos and Jonah, though, Obadiah is a prophet. And God has called him to deliver a message, um, not to the people of Israel, but to the nation of Edom. Um, And, and, you know, honestly, the the history and the context surrounding Edom is a little complicated, but I'm going to do my best to give you kind of the highlights, the essentials. Um, And I think by the end of this, we're going to maybe know more about um, Obadiah and Edom than most Christians out there. And so Edom was an ancient nation. Um, It would have been located just south, um, I guess modern-day Jordan, but just south of the southern Jewish kingdom of Judah. And and there's a lot of history between the people of Edom, the people of Israel, and and Judah. And so it it actually all starts with the story of Jacob and Esau um, back in the book of Genesis. Um, So if you remember, Abraham had a son named Isaac. Well, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Um, Esau was the firstborn son, but Jacob stole the birthright from Esau by by tricking his dad. And and this all matters because the Jewish nations of Judah and Israel, they trace their ancestry back to Jacob. Uh, The Edomites trace their ancestry back to Esau. And so while they were very much like brother nations, um, obviously there was a little bit of bad blood between the two of them. So now fast forward to the, the days of Obadiah. It is sometime in the middle of the 6th century B.C. Um, at this point, Israel, the northern Jewish kingdom, um, it has been conquered by Babylon. And it has been that way for 150 years. Um, it happened back in 722 B.C. Judah, now the southern kingdom of Israel, has held out for that whole time. Um, but finally, Babylon has captured Jerusalem, the capital, um, and, and they're trying to exile all the people. And, and Obadiah is prophesying sometime 
after that, around 586 BC. Um, so the reason that God is so upset with Edom, though, is because of the way they treated the people of Judah while Babylon was doing all of their conquering and their capturing. Um, instead of coming to their aid as a brother should, instead of letting them through their gates and through their borders, Edom turned their backs on the people of Judah. And really they did far worse than turn their backs on the people of Judah. Um, Obadiah kind of lays it out in no uncertain terms later on in the, in the chapters, verses 13 and 14 kind of kind of sum it up. He says, you should not have entered the gate of my people on the day of their calamity. You should not have joined in the gloating over Judah's disaster on the day of his calamity. You should not have looted his goods on the day of his calamity. You should not have stood at the crossings to cut off his fugitives. You should not have handed over his survivors on the day of his distress. Um, and so not only did Edom refuse to help Judah, to welcome Judah, but they, um, they made a terrible situation even worse. I mean, they, they blocked the road so the people couldn't escape, and then they ended up turning in these fleeing Jewish people over to the Babylonians. Um, and, and the worst thing is um, that they were proud, like so, so proud of everything they did because they didn't think anybody could do anything about it. Um, well, Obadiah is here to let them know differently. Um, and it's, and it's, it's really that pride um, that he has the biggest problem with. In verses 3 and 4, we, we heard it, he says, Your proud heart has deceived you, you that live in the clefts of the rock, whose dwelling is in the heights. You say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. So the, the, the proud will fall. I mean, that is really the, the one point that Obadiah is trying to drive home with these 21 short verses. And, you know, pride is, that's not an, an unfamiliar topic to us religious folks, right? I mean, it's something we've always believed to be bad. And, you know, just so we're clear, I'm not talking about the, the pride that we have in our, in, our, in our kids or our grandkids, our, our partners, you know. Um, you know. For example, Ellis is, is starting to read. And so you better believe that every time he sounds out a long word or finishes a book by himself, we are like jumping for joy and, and we're clapping because we're so proud of him. Um, and he's proud of himself, too, and, and he should be. Like that, that's a good kind of pride. The type of pride that is dangerous and sinful, like it, it's different than that, right? It's, um, it's more self-centered. It's more self-promoting. It's kind of looking down on others. And Christian preachers and teachers, they, I mean, they've been warning about the, the dangers of this kind of pride for as long as Christianity has been a thing. Um, there was a, a group of monks in the fourth century known as the Desert Fathers, and they came up with this, um, this list that we know today as the seven deadly sins. Uh, well, guess what the first one on the list is? Pride. Um, St. Augustine goes so far as to say that pride is the beginning of sin. Um, even our own guy, John Wesley, he had a lot to say about this, but he, he wrote in one sermon that pride is the first grand hindrance to all religion. So the point is you're not going to find too many, um, too many folks celebrating pride, right? They're not going to be saying it's a good thing. The question I want to try and answer this morning, though, is, is why? Like, why is pride so bad? And, and I'm sure that we could come up with a million different reasons, um, but I'm going to focus on just a few of them this morning. Um, and, and the very first reason why pride is bad, I think, is because it makes us feel invincible. This is the example we find with the Edomites in our passage, right? And their whole country was built up high in the mountains. Um, Obadiah even said that in, in verses 3 and 4. Proud heart has deceived you, you that live in the clefts of a rock. You say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Um, and so their location made them think that, you know, that they would not have to answer for the sins that they made against Judah. And, and you know, I, I think it's safe to say that this kind of pride, it, it runs rampant in the world today. I mean, it probably already has. 
but I just we think I think we, we see it in corporations, right, who try to cheat the market, cheat their workers without consequence. We see it in governments and politicians who care more about their own power than taking care of their people. We, we see it in celebrities who think they're above the law. Um, I think if we boil it down, we could even see it in ourselves when we, we put on a good face in front of people um, just so they don't know anything's up. We just try to keep up appearances, right? Um, and so pride makes us feel like we should be invincible even when, even when we're not. And then another danger of pride is that um, I, I, think it, I think it makes us believe that we never need other people. Um, I, I realized that this was a, a, little, a little piece that I, I had deep within me shortly after I, I got married. Um, I've probably mentioned this before, but I would never claim to be the world's most handy man. Um, if I can get the, the batteries and the remote control switched out first time, right direction, like I'm, I'm celebrating that. Now, when, when, right after Chelsea and I, I got married though, well, I should say Chelsea has a degree in engineering and so she's good at pretty much everything, like frustratingly good at everything. Don't tell her I said that. But right after we got married, we had to install a, a ceiling fan in our apartment. And you know, I should have known that I'd be better off just letting her tell me exactly what I was supposed to do, but I didn't. Um, I wanted to prove that I could do it all by myself. Um, guess what? I couldn't. Um, it's, it's a miracle. It is a miracle that I didn't electrocute myself that morning. Um, and of course, I, I beat my head against the wall for hours and hours and hours. And I just would not admit defeat. Um, but finally, I gave in and I called Chelsea over for help. And lo and behold, we were done with the whole project in like 15 minutes. But that's the problem with pride, though, right? It, it makes us feel like we should be capable of doing all things on our own. It tells us that to need somebody else is weakness and that asking for help is to admit that we are failures. Now, now the last danger of pride that I think is worth mentioning um, is the obvious one. When we have so much pride that it makes us feel like we are better than everybody else. Um, you've probably been around people like this. Um, if you have, then you notice one thing, like they're, they're pretty annoying to be around. Um, two, they think they can do no wrong. And of course, I, I find this one to be tricky because we all think that we're right, right? If we didn't think we were right, we wouldn't hold the opinions that we do. But the problem with pride is that it makes us confuse opinion with facts. And it, I think it keeps us from being able to learn and to grow and to change. And, and so if, if pride is something God wants us to avoid because of all the ways that it separates us from Jesus, the way it separates us from each other, well, what is it that God wants for us instead? Um, well, of course, the opposite of pride is humility. Um, and, and I can't think of a better definition for humility than what we heard from the scripture that Jody read to us just a minute ago from the book of Philippians. Um, this is Paul giving a description of Jesus. He says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard, regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. So where pride tells us that we are invincible, humility tells us that we are vulnerable. Right? And we hear that and we think, oh, I don't, I don't like that. But being vulnerable is not a bad thing. Like Jesus gave up perfection so that he could come and be a vulnerable human being just like us. And so while vulnerability might mean we can be hurt, be scared, Vulnerability also means that we can be redeemed. And then where pride tries to convince us that we don't need anybody else, humility teaches us the value of community. You know, community is another one of those things that we talk a lot about in the church. And that's because it's one of the foundations of our faith. Like I've said this just a couple weeks ago, that we cannot be Christians without community. I need you, you need me. Asking for help is not failure. And needing other people isn't weakness. Like actually knowing our own limitations 
and being able to share the work with others, that's literally how God designed the church to be. I think of Paul talking about the, the body of Christ. And finally, where pride tells us that we're better than everybody else. Humility reminds us that we are all equally loved by the creator of the universe. Um, John Wesley had something to say about this too. It's one of my favorite quotes. He said, as the wax melteth away from the fire, so doth pride before love. So friends, the, the antidote to pride is love. You know, it's impossible to think of ourselves as better than others when we remember how much Jesus loves them and we remember that Jesus went to the same exact lengths to save them as he did to save us. So, so pride that is self-serving and self-glorifying, um, it just has no place in the life of a Christian. Um, it will only carry us further away from Jesus and further away from one another. Um, the path to Jesus is a path of humility, and the path of humility is paved with love. Um, and, and really, the way Obadiah goes on to lay it out, we actually only have two choices. So we can choose to be humble, or we can choose to be humbled by God. Um, now, that, that first one might sound hard to, to be humble, but I'll tell you what, that second one sounds absolutely terrifying, and I want no part of it. And, and so I say, let's, let's choose the path of humility. Let's not think too highly of ourselves. Let's remember that we're not always right. Let's remember that real strength comes from, from this, from community. And last but not least, let's remember that love for God and love for one another is the one thing that is guaranteed to melt the pride away. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is an oldie and a goodie. It's I Surrender All. That's number 354 in your hymnals. I invite you to stand as you're able. Let's all sing together.
Amen. Thank you all again for being here this morning as we uh, were able to worship together. Thank you as well for everybody who tuned in online. Um, friends, receive now the benediction. You are the people of God. So surrender your pride, go into the world, and love others as he has loved you. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.